thanks, thanks to all of you for coming. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk about this paper. Please feel free to just interrupt me, ask questions as we go along. That's how we tend to do things, and I get nervous if nobody's asking any questions. Um, this is joint work with Jesse Shapiro, who's an economist at Brown, and Matt Taddy, who's a statistician at Microsoft Research and Chicago Booth. Um, and th this paper is part of a broader agenda, I guess, that we have trying to measure and understand political polarization in the US. And the particular thing that we're thinking about in this project is partisan speech and partisan language. Um, so anybody who's been paying attention knows there are people on the right, people on the left in this country talk very differently. This slide is now totally out of date because we've replaced this with 101 new partisan phrases, radical Islamic terrorism, so on and so forth. Um, but you know, over the period of data that we're going to be looking at, which goes back a long way, there are lots of different examples, estate tax and death tax. Uh, you know, Republicans, when they're talking about taxes, like to talk about tax relief because that sounds like relieving some terrible burden from you. Democrats like to talk about tax breaks to describe those same policies because that sounds like somebody's getting out of something that they um, should pay. It was noted after the shooting in Orlando at that nightclub that within a couple of days, the left and right had coalesced into people on the left calling that event a mass shooting, people on the right calling that event a terrorist attack, those two things plugging into very different narratives. Um, so we've been interested in, in partisan language for a while. It's clear today, if you look at this, that um, at least a lot of this language does not arise by accident, but that there's a whole sort of industry of focus groups and consultants and people who are trying to think about how to make rhetoric uh, as effective as possible. So these are memos written by Frank Luntz, who's one of the most famous such consultants. Um, these are memos that were distributed to Republican congressional candidates, and they're sort of manuals of how should you talk? What words should you use to talk about taxes? What words should you use to talk about health care? You want to call it Obamacare, a Washington takeover of health care, for example. Um, another example from those memos, this was back in 2006 at the time that George W. Bush was proposing reforming Social Security and there was a big debate about reforming Social Security. Luntz says, when, if you're a Republican talking about that, don't call that privatization of Social Security, which is what basically everybody had called it up until then, because privatization makes people nervous, makes them scared. They think of Russia and Eastern Europe and all kinds of bad things. Instead, say what we're trying to do is personalize Social Security. We want to talk about the personalization of Social Security. People like that better in, in his focus groups. Now, that might sound like a good idea. It might sound crazy. Personalization is not a, such an easy word to trip off your tongue. But what is clear, if you look at the data, is that people in Congress follow this advice. So if you look at the 2005 Congress, Republicans say personal account 184 times and private account only five times. Democrats wildly reversed the other way. I'm not sure quite what happened to the five Republicans who screwed up and said private account, but pretty much everybody is getting the memo and, and following along. And what's also true from, we know this from our past work, from other people's work, is this kind of partisan language doesn't just stay in Congress. It's not some idiosyncratic thing that's restricted to debate in Congress, but it filters out through the media and into the way we all talk about politics. So just as an example, these are headlines from the Washington Post and the Washington Times, center left, way on the right, newspapers respectively. A given event, the Washington Post is using private accounts, the Washington Times is using personal accounts. Michael. Maybe you're getting, do we even know that it originates in DC? No. We don't know what, what I, that sort of diffusion is. Yeah, so I think um, there's like a separate, really interesting set of questions that we're not going to tackle here that people have, other people have thought about some, but I think there's a lot more work to do understanding how do these things um, get born, diffuse. Um, we, we know for, for many of the individual cases, so like death tax, for example, which is quite a famous example of this as a, as a thing to call the tax that you pay on your estate after you die. 
uh, you know, that word, if you trace it back, actually goes way back. So people are using that phrase going all the way back, like in the 19th century, but very rarely. And then there's a specific moment where one of these, basically one of these consultants popularizes using it and it kind of takes off. But I think there's, there's a bunch of interesting questions, I think, and partly that this research will suggest. I had talked to you, I, th I think, before and uh, was saying to one of your students today, I, something I would love to do is look at, like, with that example of the Orlando nightclub shooting, when things happen and, and these kinds of political framings evolve very quickly in real time, kind of see over that short time span, you know, in the, in the minutes, hours, days after something happens, how long does it take us to figure out, ah, this is the way we should frame it. But that's not going to be this, this paper. This paper is going to ask what, in a sense, is a very simple question, and one, to be honest, we sort of thought of as like, okay, well, we'll do this to start, you know, in the first month and then move on to all the other questions, and that one question ended up being, I won't tell you how many years that we've been working on this. Um, we just want to know, is this a new phenomenon? So to what extent is the partisan division in language that we see today something which has always been true? Is it something which uh, has, it, it might be true in the past just using different words? Is it something that's evolved over time? Maybe it was high in the past, then low, then high? Um, or is it some kind of genuinely new innovation? Um, and so what we're going to do is, we have, we have the f complete text of the US congressional record going back to 1873 based on OCR text. So that's like a verbatim transcript of everything that was said in Congress over that period. You know, each of those years is like a few thousand pages, like bound volumes in the library. Um, and so we're going to try to measure trends in partisanship over that period. There is, um, at least for us, this may not seem like a methodological challenge to you guys, but we started out basically approaching this using what seemed to us like an obvious statistical methodology, which we then subsequently discovered, as I'll show you, goes way wrong. And so th there's a basic challenge here um, in, in getting good estimates of this change in partisanship over time that account for the fact that the quality of the data is changing, the amount of speech is changing, a lot of other things are changing over time, and we want to try to, try to decompose those. So there, the paper has, in part, a methodological piece. What we're, we're going to show you a couple of measures, um, but the main one that we ultimately focus on is sort of a, a simple choice model using some methods borrowed from machine learning um, and text analysis to try to address that issue. And so we'll look at what is the overall trend, and then we'll try to break that out and decompose what's going on. Um, just, just as background, you know, there is some prior work. There, there's prior work on polarization in Congress. There's prior work on polarization in the public. There's also some prior work on language. Um, the, the takeaway from this literature broadly, and this is part of why this ended up being interesting to us, is it, it mostly has the thrust of the idea we all have that polarization is going way up or that what's happening today is somehow unprecedented is basically a myth. Like, if you look at the data, you don't see that. So, so the literature looking at voters, that's been argued very strongly. Mo Fiorina, who's a political scientist here at Stanford and others have argued basically the idea that the American public is getting more polarized is a myth. Looking at Congress, we do see it going up recently. So the typical measure is something like looking at how people vote in Congress, looking at roll call votes. Those do show increasing polarization over time, but they also show that polarization was as high or higher in the past, earlier in this century or earlier in the last century, the late 19th century. So that all has a flavor of nothing is really new. So you'll see that what we find here is a little bit different than that. Um, okay, and then just to flag, there's, there's one paper by Suresh Naidu, who's uh, an MSNE here and some co-authors that, that looked at a very similar question using basically the same data. And so we're going to end up differing from them mainly in, in like the methodology and the answer that we ultimately get. So I'll tell you about that. Um, OK, so this is, as we said, congressional record text. It's like raw OCR text. So there's some work to do to turn that into structured data where we can identify when a speech stops and ends, who is the speaker for a given speech, and then matching that to metadata about the speakers like their party that we're going to need to use. We do some standard kind of text processing stuff, and we're going to end up, for the purpose of this 
project, the main results I'm going to show you are all treating this as uh, counts of bigrams, basically. So we're going to have two word phrases. Yeah, so these are, so we are re removing stems, taking out a bunch of stop words, and so we're combining these. And so, for example, walking and walks, do they yeah. map on the same? Yeah, yeah. So that's what we're using the Porter stemmer, which is like a standard lemmatization. Um, and so we end up with counts of these kinds of diagrams. Something that's, that's important background as we start looking at these results, and you'll see why it matters, is just that the total amount that people talk in Congress has gone way up over time. So this is just like the total amount of speech in Congress from 1880 to the present. Um, and it, it's gone very sharply up. We looked into this because we were puzzled, like, why is it so dramatic over this period in the 1960s? But it turns it's not a mistake in the data. It really is the number of bills being introduced, the amount that Congress is in session, the amount that a given person talks, all these things are going up over time. That's going to be important once I start talking about potential bias in some of these naive estimators that you might use. Because as I'll show you, this, there's this important small sample bias. How big that is is going to depend on how small the sample is. So it's going to be bigger back here and smaller up here. OK? Um, let me then talk about how we approach this problem from, from a modeling perspective. Um, we're we're going we're gonna to think of basically a simple statistical model without a lot of uh, detailed underlying modeling of what are the objectives of, of the people doing this speech. So following a lot of literature in, in text mining, we're going to think of the vector of bigram counts that we observe as a result of a multinomial process. So what we see for each person, each Congress member in each year, is a vector of counts. The dimension of that vector is the total size of the vocabulary. So there's one entry for each possible phrase that could have been said. That's like on the order of a million. Um, and we're going to assume that each person has a party affiliation, which is either Republican or Democrat. We throw out the small number of people who have third party or, or, or independent affiliations. Importantly, we're going to want to control for a vector of observables in doing this. That's going to include things like region interacting with time. So one of the big things that changes in Congress over this period is the realignment of the South going from being overwhelmingly Democratic to Republican. You could imagine how that could screw up what we're doing here. If, for example, the, the suddenly all of the Democrats all of the de Democrats used to use sort of southern language. That's going to look like a partisan difference in language, but it's really a regional difference in language. And we want to separate regional differences from party differences. Um, so we'll think of those vectors as drawn from a multinomial where there's some, the vector of probabilities in that distribution, the true probabilities of each phrase, they're going to vary over time. They're going to depend on your party. That's the key thing we're going to be interested in. And they're going to depend on this vector of controls. And so once, once if we take this leap, notice that this, is, this seems kind of totally standard if you're in some um, you know, statistics audience or doing, doing text mining. But if you actually thought of this as a model of language, it's totally crazy. The idea that, that the way I'm talking is taking, it may sound to you like this is what I'm doing, but I'm taking repeated IID draws where each word that I say is independent of the last word I say. It's a very strange model of language. It obviously ignores a lot of dependence across words. Once we take this leap, though, we can define the question that we want to ask, how partisan is language in a much more precise way, which is basically going to boil down to how different are those two vectors of choice probabilities. That's what we will mean here by partisanship. Just how different is the speech of Democrats and Republicans, and how has that changed over time? Posed that way, you could think of a, lots of different metrics you could put on how different are those two Q vectors. You could look at the Euclidean distance between them. You could use segregation measures, which are a natural kind of metric for this sort of thing. What, what we're going to do is slightly different. We're going to use a measure that we think then gives some nice interpretation, which is just what is the diagnosticity of language about party? That is, in a given year, how well can I guess your party from hearing you speak for a fixed amount of time? So if hearing somebody talk for a minute in 
2000, I can guess their party much better than I could have in 1950. We'll say that partisanship of language has gone up, that the language is more different between the two parties. Yeah? I'm just thinking about sort of like a null hypothesis here. Imagine that there were no difference in how oh. the two parties spoke about an issue, but we also see another effect where different parties speak about different issues, right? Where <laughs> if you hear me talking about college, you learn something that I'm probably left-leaning. Yep. I'm wondering, are there ways to actually distinguish these in the way that you've modeled it? It doesn't seem like there would be. Not yet. Not at this stage. So, so this, this model and this posing of the question, our answer is going to be a combination of those two things. It's going to combine. So our measure could be high either because you use different language to talk about the same thing or you talk about different things. Democrats talk about poverty. Republicans talk about terrorism or something like that. Um, at the end, I'll come back to that and show you what we have done to try to decompose those, which is um, you know, imperfect, but I think we have a, a good first step at trying to do that. But that's a very good question. OK. Remember, you can interrupt and ask questions if you want. Um, OK. So let me just show you what this means formally, then. What, what exactly is our measure? So um, thinking like a Bayesian world here, imagine you're a Bayesian observer. There's some politician in front of you. You don't know who they are. You have a 50-50 prior on whether they're a Republican or a Democrat. And you hear them say one phrase in this world of the model. You hear them say one phrase, and that turned out to be phrase J. What is the posterior probability you place on that person being a Republican? It's going to be this. The probability that a Republican would have said that phrase over the total probability that that phrase would have been said. We're going to call that rho JT. So you can think of that as a, as a measure of the Republicanness of a phrase. Phrase is more Republican. If hearing somebody say it tells you they're a Republican. Then ex ante, what is the posterior that I expect to assign to your true party. That is, how well, in this sense, do I think I'll be able to guess your true party? That's going to be given by this expression. So remember we said you were equally likely to be a Republican or a Democrat. If you happen to be a Republican, which happens with probability 0.5, which phrase you say will be determined by Q? And for each of those phrases, I will assign posterior rho. So the expe expectation of, of rho over the phrases you might say is given by that product. And same thing for Democrats, but now my posterior on your true party is 1 minus rho. So this is, roughly speaking, this is the probability I expect to be able to guess your true party. And that's going to be our main measure. The only other wrinkle is this depends on x. And we want one measure that there will be one number for a given year. So our main measure is going to be the average of that across the x's that occur in a given session. So it's going to be saying, what if I had two politicians that I had to guess, and they had, in some sense, average characteristics, what's the chance I could tell them apart? So that's our main measure of partisanship. You see it goes from 1 half to 1. So if it's 1 half, I'll never be able to guess your party from how you speak. If it's 1, that means that the vocabularies are totally non-overlapping. So there's like a set of language that Republicans use and a set of language that Democrats use, and there's no overlap. So if I hear you say one thing, I could tell for sure. We train this every year. Mm -hmm. We're actually we're going to fit that we're going to fit it to the entire series, and there are just uh, the only thing that makes that different from just separately fitting it every year is the coefficients on these x's are going to be the same across years. Was there, like, for example, <clears throat> when you have small, uh, small, few observations of a given phrase in a given year, like typically when you're doing text analysis, you just drop everything with fewer than k occurrences. Yep. So I feel like what I would do would be different if I'm training per year, because now I'm losing a lot more of the tail yeah. versus if I'm averaging across. Yeah. Let me show you. So we're, we're going to, in a sec, talk a bunch about that specific. What do we do with rare phrases? Because yeah. that's going to be at the heart of this bias <coughs> that, that can screw us and other people up. Um, but yeah, you should think of it as the case where we're doing it separately by year. Therefore, we need a lot of information, basically. And we would be losing. I'll show you that if we make that k reasonably high, we start to lose a lot of information. OK. Um, OK, so this is, this is like a simple model. And it's a simple statistical problem, basically. If we wrote down that model, how would we estimate what are, we need to estimate what these Qs are. 
And then once we know what the Qs are, we can plug them in and compute this measure. Um, so the question is, how, how would we estimate this pi? How would we estimate those Qs? Um, so here's, here's where we get back to uh, the sort of narrative of this project. What did we initially do? The, the, the sort of obvious thing to do, just if you're sort of coming at this from uh, econometrics, kind of statistics we grew up on, is you say, well, look, these Qs are something that have an analog in the data. That's what share of the time that this phrase is said. Is it said by a Republican? So a natural estimator for Q is just the share of the actual times that phrase was said in a particular year, to Michael's point, that were said by Republicans. Once you know, have that estimator, you can plug that in to estimate rho, and you can plug it in to estimate the whole thing. This is the maximum likelihood estimator for this model. It's not crazy. It inherits all of the nice properties of maximum likelihood, efficiency, consistency. Um, but the key thing is those asymptotics are right as, you know, MLE is good asymptotically in general when n gets big, right? That's what the theorems in statistics say. What is n here? n getting big here means that the amount of speech you have per phrase has to get big because each of these cues has to converge to the truth so that the overall thing converges to the truth. And so the problem is going to be we're miles from that because we have lots and lots and lots of phrases that are very rare. And, and that's going to make this. And also, I mean, this might seem so simple as to be kind of dumb, but there are a bunch of other things that people have done that you would be natural applications of sort of simple text mining methods to this that are going to suffer from the same problem. Um, but suppose you forget that, didn't, hadn't thought about that potential bias, and you just said, well, let's go ahead and estimate this. This is what you would have gotten. So this is partisanship of speech over time based on that MLE estimate. And we weren't doing exactly this, but a graph something like this um, is what we first computed. And we spent, I won't tell you how much time staring at it, thinking how interesting it was. Um, you know, actually, speech was much more partisan in the past than it is today. Um, and then at some point, as a kind of cross-check diagnostic, it occurred to us to do the following thing. Let's just take our data, randomly reshuffle who in the data is a Republican and a Democrat, like reshuffle the party labels, and recompute the model. That kind of permutation test is like a standard diagnostic to make sure you're not screwing up. And in this context, we know that if we randomly assign the party labels, we know what the truth should be. Partisanship should be 0.5. You can't tell how somebody's party from their speech if we randomly assigned the labels independently of your speech. So we say, let's do that. Let's compute it. Let's make sure it's a flat line at 0.5. And when you do that, you get this. <laughs> so this is the same partisanship estimated on the data where we randomly assign party labels. So that was not so good for us. Um, what does it mean? It means, by definition, that there is a big bias in these estimators. right? Even on data where the truth is 0.5, we're estimating 0.6. And that bias is varying a lot over time. What is that coming from? How do you think about that? It's actually quite simple. If I have data where many, many phrases are only said three or five or seven times, there are going to be lots of phrases that look partisan by chance. It just happened that the Republicans said it five times and the Democrats never said it. And the model that, that I wrote down, if we estimate it using that plug-in estimator, is going to attribute all of that to, to being true partisanship. If it was said five times by Republicans, my best guess is, wow, this is a phrase that only Republicans say. And this is also uh, giving equal weight to each phrase in that, in that estimate, right? Yeah. So it's going to be dominated by that long tail. Exactly. Yeah, that, this, we're treating, when we plug this in, we're then going to treat each of these as if it was estimated correctly. And so we're giving a lot of weight to that long tail. And so it's intuitive that the bias is upward, right? Because imagine the case where the true cues are actually the same. Then the sample cues can only be more different than that. We're going to be biased toward being different. And it's intuitive that it might, that what matters for this time series is that the size of that bias is varying over time. What would it tend to vary with? Obviously, it's going to vary with the amount of speech we have. And I showed you there's much less speech early on than later. So that's going to tend to produce this trend. OK. Um, let me not belabor uh, th this too much. So you can write out a kind of decomposition of where this bias is coming from. And 
uh, understand it. We can actually show that the first order approximation of that bias, if you just, if you only account for the fact that the amount of speech is changing, you actually get a pattern in the bias that looks very similar to this, meaning it really is just the change in total speech that's driving a lot of it. Um, so that that's, ends up being the problem we need to solve. This, just for comparison, is the plot from that published paper by Jensen et al. that I mentioned. Um, and so their big conclusion in this paper, so the pink line is, is, is the series from their published paper. Their big conclusion is, you know, polarization has been going up, but it also used to be the same in the past. This happens to look very similar to the time pattern of polarization estimated based on roll call votes. And so they're sort of saying, you know, polariz polarization in speech looks like polarization in other things. The dotted line here is, is randomly assigned parties using their data. And you see that the first half of that, the fact that it was high in the past, seems to be an artifact of this kind of bias. So that shows up in, in their measure, too. Okay. So to what you said, an obvious thing to do if this is your problem is just let's cut the, the number of phrases to get rid of the ones that are used rarely. Um, and the trade-off in that is going to be that is going to tend to reduce the bias, but it's also going to reduce the signal in the data and leave you with a lot of noise. So it, this is just showing you as, you as you cut more and more aggressively, this is like we only keep phrases spoken at least 500 times. Um, you do diminish the bias. So that gray line is getting flatter and flatter. But you also end up with quite a lot of noise. And so this, you see even the gray line here is going up and down quite a lot over time. So the uncertainty of what's happening over this period you're left with is pretty high. Or here too, you see these kind of ups, ups and downs that are also there in the random series. Um, so there, there are two other things to do that we think are better than that. We're going to kind of introduce two possible solutions that have different pros and cons. So one is what we'll call a leave-out estimator. I'm not going to go through the details of this, but basically one way to think about the source of the bias is this product in our measure, Q, which is how often something was said, times rho, which is how Republican was that phrase. In the, in the basic measure, th those two things are estimated using the same data. And this is a monotonically increasing function of that. And that means that sample covariance between those two things is going to be positive, because they have the same errors in them. And they're varying together. So the, the approach of this measure is to say, let's, let's essentially use different data to estimate the Qs and to estimate the rows, to make those independent by construction. Um, and that is. Similar to dropping data, it's going to get rid of the bias, but it's going to uh, throw out a lot of information as well. So this is, this is what you get if you do that. So this starts to, this gray line is now flat at 0.5, starts to look like something closer uh, to, to what we end up thinking is the right answer, and it starts to look like something really has changed recently. Our preferred estimator is going to be somewhat different from that. We're going to um, estimate that multinomial model, but we're going to use similar sort of penalized estimation, lasso type penalties, if you're familiar with that, um, to control overfitting. And we'll do it in a particular way. We'll use some tricks approximating that multinomial likelihood with a Poisson. And in the end, that's going to shrink. It's going to take account of the fact that we know which phrases were said a lot and which were said few. And so those cues for phrases that were only said a couple of times are going to be pulled back close to equal, but it's going to let the ones we have a lot of data for speak clearly. So just to make sure I get that, the, the a lasso will shrink coefficients that are small back to zero, right? Essentially, it's trying to say, we only care about these things. And in practice, wouldn't that have very similar effects to dropping the phrases that you don't see very much? Because the, you know, their estimates would be highly uncertain anyway. Yes, no, so it, it's, it, it is going to do, it's going to set a bunch of these coefficients to zero, for sure, which is similar, definitely is equivalent to dropping sure. some subset of phrases. The only difference is we're choosing which phrases to drop, not just based on frequency of occurrence, mm -hmm. but also based on how asymmetrically they're said right. by the two parties. Right. Um, and so that's going, and, and it's also, I mean, there's a, a little wrinkle because of these X's that are controls. Mm -hmm. It's also going to be using you know, it's going to be choosing them based on the marginal information of that phrase relative to those control variables. But it's 
it is in the same spirit. I think any model you estimate using these data is going to have to do some kind of feature selection. Um, and so this is just going to do it in a, in, a, in a better way from the perspective of trading off bias, bias and variance, perhaps, than just dropping based on number of occurrence directly. Okay. So this is the final series that we estimate. That we've, we've squeezed out a lot of the noise. You can see the gray series is now flat at 0.5. And this paints qualitatively a very different picture than any of the ones that I showed you before. It says, unlike roll call votes, unlike all of these measures of what's going on with voters, if we look at the way people talk in Congress, something really is different today than at any point in the past, going all the way back to 1880. Um, and interestingly, that change happens very sharply and discreetly in the early 1990s. MTV. So we'll talk, it's all MTV, absolutely. Um, it's, it's me graduating from high school. That's the thing that drove polarization in the US. So we'll talk about thoughts on what happened there. Um, let me show you some other results to, to kind of start to unpack this. And I'll skip over some of these quickly to, to make sure we have time to, to discuss. Um, so one thing you could ask about this is like, OK, it went way up. But is the magnitude of this important? You know, by our measure, something, something I, that I made up went from you know, 0 0.502 to 0 0.525. Is that big? Is that small? Who knows? Um, remember that the units here are, what is the probability I could guess your true party if I hear one phrase? That's what these units mean. And so as a way to think about the magnitudes, we can use the fitted model to translate that into the equivalent answer for any number of phrases. So this is on the x-axis, how many phrases do I get to hear? On the y-axis, what's the chance I could guess your party? The more I get to hear, the better I could guess your party. And this is showing that in 1873, 1989, and 2008. And you can see that it, again, really didn't change between those two years. By the end of our data in about 2008, if I hear you speak for one minute, I can guess your party with about 80% probability, whereas before that was 53. There are different models for how I see this happening in machine learning. So is this, uh, for example, are you just saying that I'm sampling a bunch of different phrases that are non-overlapping? Is this I have some holdout set of like actual text? Yeah, this is, so this is from the fitted model. Yeah. Ima imagine it's like I fit the parameters of that multinomial model, and now we're going to do it in simulated data from the model. So we're going to simulate. The model says now we have an estimate of, of the correct probability distribution across the phrases. So I'm going to say we'll simulate a bunch of data from Republicans, simulate a bunch of data from Democrats, right. and compare. And we don't actually do the simulation, because in this case, there's like some, actually, I think we do, I take that back. We now, we switch to doing the simulation because to make it correct. So we actually do that simulation. So this may or may not actually reflect the frequencies with which people actually speak. Well, I mean, yes and no. So the estimates only, the only information that the estimates use is the frequency with which people say the phrases. We want to do it using the estimates rather than the raw data precisely because we want to be doing that weighting of things that were said a lot relative to things that were said a little. Okay. Um, but I think, I think a fair question is, could we do versions of something similar as maybe as like a cross check on this using like a cross validation type approach on a holdout sample. And I think the answer is yes, we could do more of that. Um, okay, so now I'm going to spin through some results. Here is just in case you're curious, our measure of partisanship of speech and the traditional political science measure of partisanship of roll call votes, like the polarization, ideological polarization in Congress. We started out expecting basically what we would estimate would sort of track this more or less, and clearly it doesn't. So very importantly here, this says we are not arguing that, that speech is a measure of the degree of polarization in some broad sense. You might think this is a measure of the degree of polarization in some broad sense. What's clear is the process that, that drives partisan language is different from that. And it's really operating some independent track here. That's just the cross-section of that, which I'll skip. Um, 
So now we have this fitted model. We have it fit on 130 years of data. I'd like to dig in and, and look at more what's going on, including within and between topics. So let, let me show you a bit of that. So one thing you'd like to look at from the fitted model is, well, which are the most partisan phrases? What are the phrases that are really diagnostic in a given year? How is that changing over time? This measure gives us a nice way to define what is a partisan phrase in this model, which is if you took that, if you took a given phrase out of the vocabulary, how much would my predictive power fall? So if I prohibited people from using the phrase radical Islamic terrorism, how would my chance of guessing who's a Republican go down? Um, so once we do that, we can define for any given year, kind of at random, here's 1907 to 1908, what are the most partisan Republican phrases and the most partisan Democratic phrases. You could stare at this for a while, depending on your knowledge of US history. It might make sense. It might make not so much sense. Uh, I had no idea what these things were. If you go look, a good cross check is to go look at the party platforms in this year, you can kind of figure out what's going on. So this is very consistent. The Republican platform in that year, the main thing that it was calling for was taking care of veterans of the Spanish-American and Indian Wars. And a bunch of these phrases are about that. Democrats were in sort of trust busting mode, trying to attack big corporations. And these phrases are related to those things. Bureau of Corporations is like the predecessor of the FTC, antitrust enforcement for the US. Um, so you could do this for a bunch of years. Note to the earlier question, these are really differences in topics rather than different language for the same thing. This is the, the Republicans are talking about wars and the Democrats are talking about antitrust, basically. Um, I won't go through these in detail. You can see similar things in other years. Fast forward to 1995, which is the, year, the first Congress where this thing really starts shooting up. And the picture you see is pretty different. For example, there's a bunch of phrases on both sides related to taxes. Republicans are saying tax relief, Democrats are saying tax break, tax bre breaks for the wealthy, the wealthiest. Uh, death tax and estate tax are on this list a little further down. So here it looks more like starting to use different language to talk about a given topic. Um, this is just the distribution, which I'll skip. One thing you might have wondered is how much of this change is new phrases being introduced, new, new coinages like death tax maybe. Um, so th the way we, and, and this, is sort, this is sort of related to where do these things come from, although not, it doesn't really get at it too much. So the simple thing that we did is say, let's separate out all vocabulary that first appears in Congress post 1980 versus vocabulary that had always existed. And just compute the partisanship of those two subsets of text separately. So what does that mean? It means, Imagine I'm doing my guess your party exercise, but you're only allowed to use the historical vocabulary. Or I'm doing my guess your party exercise, and you're only allowed to use post-1980 vocabulary. So this is the partisanship just using the post-1980 vocabulary, which is much, much, much higher, suggesting that what is new is very partisan. But you almost can't see it on this graph because it's so much lower. But if I just use the old vocabulary, it's still going up. And, and up almost as much as the baseline measure. So the old vocabulary is getting more partisan as well. OK, so let's talk about topics then. Um, we would like a clean way to divide changes in what you talk about from changes in how you talk about it. Doing that requires some definition of what are topics. And we've played around with a bunch of different ways of doing that. In the end, what we settled on um, was a fairly, we, we, try, we did various automated things. We ended up settling on a fairly manual approach to try to get topics that were a, a fairly small set of topics that had clear semantic interpretation. So we, we basically do an iterated thing where we look at the most partisan phrases, kind of divide those into what seem like the most important topics, use those to define keywords, look at the phrases that come back, use those to define some more keywords, and kind of keep iterating until we get sets of phrases associated with each topic. In the, so these are not thing, these are, okay, so, so we started, we were looking at the most partisan phrase lists as uh, 
as a way to identify the main topics, but we were, these are not necessarily the most partisan topics in the sense that like once we realize there are a bunch of partisan phrases having to do with mail, and we take everything that has to do with mail, yeah. whether it's partisan or not. But yes, the Postal Service was in the past a very uh, partisan issue. So here's that decomposition. The pink series, as usual, is our main measure. The black series is within topic partisanship. So what does that mean? It means I have to guess your party, but only, you're only allowed to use one topic. And between topic partisanship is I have to guess your party, but all I get to see is which topic you're choosing, not the actual words you used within it. Does that make sense? So we can define, using that breakdown for the within, we can define partisanship of each topic individually. I only get to hear you talk about taxes. I only get to hear you talk about defense. And this is just an average of those across topics. So what you see is that most of this increase is within topics as we've defined them. There is some increase in the between topic measure. Um, here's something a little bit like the Postal Service, just to emphasize like not everything has become more partisan recently. So one of the topics is alcohol. Alcohol is not very partisan today when it's discussed. Um, but it used to be very partisan in the past when, during the Prohibition era and during previous debates about Prohibition in the late 19th century. So this is the partisanship within that topic, and this is just the frequency with which that topic is discussed. Um, here is defense. Defense actually was not partisan very much throughout history, even though it had big spikes where we would expect around the world wars. So this is something being discussed a lot does not necessarily mean that it's discussion is partisan. People talked a lot about defense around World War II, but <clears throat> you couldn't tell based on how people were talking who was who, because they were all pretty much on the same page talking about defense. Um, so which things have gone up a lot? These are the six topics <clears throat> that really drive that recent increase. Taxes, immigration, government, health, crime, and budget discussions. These are, these are the places where we see partisanship going up a lot, and that's going to be a clue to what happened in the early 1990s to drive this. Um, so let me get to that. What happened in the early 1990s? The, the, co the, the Congress in the data where this huge change first happens is not a random Congress. It's Congress following the election in 1994. That was the year in which Republicans in the US retook control of Congress for the first time 50 years or so. And it was also an election famous for the Republican Party turning a spotlight on language as a persuasive tool and starting to really devote a lot of effort to picking and choosing carefully what words and phrases we use. So this was contract with America, was the platform the Republicans were running under. Newt Gingrich, who has happily come back into our political life in a prominent way, but at the time uh, was Speaker of the House. And they won. And Frank Luntz, who I mentioned at the beginning, was his pollster, basically, and pollster for the Republican Party. And so what they did was use polling techniques. The main, the main kind of real innovation was focus groups where people respond in real time with like little dials. So somebody will be speaking about taxes, and people are registering in real time. Do you like what they're saying? Do you not like what they're saying? And they use that to test different phrases, different vocabulary. Frank Luntz says, was asked in an interview, do you believe that language can change a, change a paradigm? He said, I don't believe it. I know it. I've seen it with my own eyes. I watched in 1994 that year when a group of us got together and said, we're going to do things completely different. So there's a lot of narrative evidence around the idea that this was a watershed election in US politics, and in particular, one that brought language to center stage as a focus. And so that suggests to us the hypothesis that, that what happened that made language in this country change so fast, it was really some kind of innovation. Something that maybe could have happened 10 years earlier, like a lot of innovations, but it happened that this was the year in which people figured out, here's a tool that can be very effective and started using it. And after the Republicans figured it out, it didn't take much time for the Democrats to copy that, and both of them then were in an arms race who could do this best. We don't have any, this paper does not definitively answer the question of what happened. We don't have any real test of that. 
one fact sort of consistent with that hypothesis, we can take all of the phrases that appear in the contract with America and define those as a topic. Say, suppose I just heard somebody use those phrases, what's happening? And those show a very big spike in partisanship themselves. So, so, and, and if you look at the topics in the contract with America, they line up very clearly with those topics I showed you, taxes, immigration, size of government, and so on. So it's all circumstantial evidence, but we think it's circumstantial evidence that points pretty clearly uh, toward this. There are other things going on, and, and one of the other things going on is not exactly MTV, but changes in cable TV and media in general. Um, C-SPAN, which is the cable network that broadcasts everything that's said on the floor of the House and Senate Live, was introduced in the late 70s and early 1980s. Um, this narrative about Gingrich and the contract with America, there's a lot of people saying this was played a central role in that because these guys could get up and talk and, and, and know that what they were saying was going on TV. Um, you should not think that people watching C-SPAN was an important part of this story because nobody watches C-SPAN to a first approximation. But what is true is because of C-SPAN, there were always TV cameras rolling. And if there are always TV cameras rolling, that means that anything you say, which is kind of stupid, your opponent can use in some TV commercial the next time. Anything you say which is witty and effective, you can use in your TV commercial, or it can be rebroadcast on the nightly news, and so on. So you can see this as, as the way we would think of it, complementary to this focus on language and kind of sound bites. The benefit to this innovation, focusing more on what phrases to say, is higher if once we get really good at it, it's going to be recorded on TV. Um, so you know, th these things are too early to be really driving this spike in the 90s. This is just zooming in on the previous graph. I think the contract with America is really the proximate thing, but these are maybe some complementary sort of innovations. Um, let me just tell you my sort of conclusion and then save a few minutes if, if people have other questions to discuss. Um, a really fair question, I, I think, at the end of everything I just showed you is, yeah, but who cares? Like, who cares how Congress people talk to each other in Congress? You know, they're, politicians are a small number of people. They're doing their weird thing. Does it matter for anything? And, and I have showed you exactly zero evidence that this matters for anything. And I don't have any evidence directly. It would be great to show here is the randomized control trial that tells you the impact of what language is used in Congress on other things. But here's what we do know. As I said, there is good evidence that this kind of language, it's not exactly clear which way the flows are going all the time. But at the end of the day, it is used not only in Congress, but also in the media and also in the broader public. We know that in laboratory experiments, this kind of language can affect how people feel about issues, their political beliefs. That's the focus groups that they're using to choose this stuff in the first place. And we know in a much broader sense that language is an important driver of group identity and also of divisions between groups. So if you have two tribes or two groups of people in Spain or two groups of people in Canada, places where people speak a different language, that for a bunch of reasons tends to strengthen ties within groups and deepen <laughs> divisions between groups. So we don't have evidence for this, but I think speculatively it seems plausible that the, the fact that to a much greater degree in the past, than, than in the past, people on the right and the left in the country are speaking different languages, that that may be contributing to this broader kind of divisions that we see. Okay. So I think we have a few minutes, yeah? If there are any other questions? Yeah. Um, I love the graphic of uh, separated by topics. Um, were there any topics you found where people got less polarized on? Over time? Yeah. Over this period? Um, I mean, there's nothing that sort of has the inverse pattern where it, it collapses during the 90s. Alcohol was one that I showed you that, that was high in the past and lower today. The postal thing is another, actually, that has that pattern. But we don't see, it doesn't, there's nothing that, that like, falls off a cliff in the 90s. 
I think I think in the, what you see in the 90s is some things become a lot more polarized and others stay the same. Yeah, I guess the follow-up question would be like, do you think, can, is there a reverse to things get polarized, or is it just that they get less talked about in general? Can some topic which has become really polarized go back to not being? Yeah, I mean, again, we saw that in some of those things like, like alcohol. I think, so we are this close to having completed, this is coming back to why our papers take five years to write, um, for a variety of reasons that we, we wanted to go back and get, regather the underlying congressional text here and in the process also extend the series further forward. So we've been working on like a new version of this data which will be much cleaner and which will also go up to the present. So uh, a really good question is what's gonna happen to that? Our series stops in 2008. What has it done since then? Um, I think you could tell very different stories. Obviously, polarization has gone up a lot. On the other hand, you could think about Trump and Bernie Sanders and as somewhat of a backlash against this kind of very programmed, poll-driven, focus-driven style of speaking by politicians. You know, this, this, the, the results of this Frank Luntz thing is people who do not sound like normal people. Normal people don't say personalization of social security. Um, and so the whole authenticity kind of aspect of Trump and Sanders, you could imagine, is pushing the other way. So we'll see. Yeah? I mean, we're also seeing <clears throat> where, let's call it end user political participation, was largely happening in person. We're now seeing a lot more of it happen in text through things like Twitter, Facebook, uh, blogs, whatever. Uh, just there's more reading and writing happening now than any time in recent history. And it would be interesting to see where the polarization is happening there as well. Like it's, it could be, it could be amplifying it, or I, I'm not actually certain. It seems like <coughs> there's... Yeah, I agree. There, there are two distinct ways you could ask that question. Imagine we take... We have all the data from Twitter, we have data from different sources, you want to look at this. Two slightly different questions one could ask. One is, if you pretended that the people on Twitter were Congress people, where do they fall on this scale? Like, are they using this language too? And the other is, if you have some a priori way of categorizing the people on Twitter, like, do they follow politicians, or there are various ways you could do that, um, how well can you guess who's who on Twitter, fitting the model separately there, so allowing those phrases to be different, and then, I mean, obviously, the, Precisely because of things having changed so much, it's hard to have long time series there going back in time. But I think, you know, what are the proximate recent trends? You know, just the last two years, knowing what the trends look like and in, in the partisanship and differences in language in those forums, I think, I think would be really interesting. It's interesting there in part because it's, it's less programmed because, it, because, yeah, individuals have no control of this, but they do echo whatever resonates. Yes. Yeah, exactly. That's, it's more spontaneous. That's part of why I liked you know, the idea of maybe looking at, at proximate changes following some events, because that also, you don't have time to do a focus group to say like, okay, there was a shooting in Orlando, how should we talk about it? So those are, are more organic kind of changes. Oh, yes. Very similar to the previous question regarding the diffusion of, the, of partisan language from Congress to the broader public. Do you have a sense of how much um, of this language is kind of leaching out or uh, diffusing into the into our language. Um, so like both how much and also, um, this is very similar to Michael's question, but um, like how that evolves once we yeah. do capture some of that. Yeah, so Sherrod and co-authors, the, the, the ones who wrote that in the paper I mentioned, um, they do some looking at the occurrence of the same language in Google Books, which is another like nice long time series. Um, and so they find that there is a lot of spillover into Google Books. That's not distinguishing which comes first and which comes second um, necessarily. And then the stuff here about media, we know that um, it gets used a lot. So, so Jesse and I have another paper where we use, we fit a model on Congress just for a single year, and then we use the occurrence of that language to measure partisanship of news outlets. So you can kind of take that as a, as a measure, which is like if this news outlet were a congressperson, does it sound like somebody way on the right or somebody way on the left? And that 
that turns out to be a very accurate measure in the sense that it varies with a lot of things you would expect it to, and it allows us to then go on and study what drives those differences across media. So that, that, that language occurs often enough in the media that you can use it to get a very accurate read on who's who. Yeah, that, so that comes back to, I think, the set of things that we don't yet know and that would be great. I think there's a lot of interesting work to do with this kind of data. We, we, we have you know, the text of Congress going all the way back. There's also lots of text from media, from books, from other sources. And so you know, more of this kind of diffusion analysis, I think, I think would be great. Yeah. Um, so let's, you have this interesting hypothesis that, or you know, rationalization here, which is like part of this difference did not arise organically. It was, it was a tactic. It was a strategy to use language as a tool. Um, <laughs> Do we have any good metrics? I mean, I could think of many to sort of understand how effective that tool has been. So, if you were to take, you know, this this Q for each, you know, or the predictive factor on each politician, and then map it with, you know, approval ratings or re-election or something, and try to understand through time, like, have people who have used more polarized language been more successful? Do you have any way to gauge that? Yeah, I mean, that's so one could do, run those kinds of regressions. I, I think I would be skeptical of them because. If I showed you, you know, he, here, here are the correlates of using a lot of this language, or here's how people who use a lot of this language fare in the following election, that's going to be mixing up a bunch of other omitted factors and causality running in the other direction. Um, another thing that makes it hard talking about the overall equilibrium impact is this is an innovation that Republicans adopt, but then Democrats copy. And so you could see this being some kind of zero sum game where, like, we both adopted this thing, and we're sort of right back where we started, even though if one of us had adopted it and the other hadn't, we would have had a big advantage. Um, so the best, you know, I wanted to put sites to things like that on this slide to the extent that we had them, and I think the best that I could come up with was these sort of laboratory studies that are similar to the focus groups, where they're showing people different kinds of language, showing different speeches by politicians, varying what words they're using, and looking at people's reported beliefs. But I think in order, in order to do this, with naturally occurring data, you really would need some clean source of variation that you could identify, some kind of natural experiment that would, that would mean some people are exposed to the opportunity to do this and other people aren't. And we just haven't been able to come up with anything like that. Yeah, I guess maybe last, last sure. question. Yeah, yeah. Great. Um, uh, you can, others can come up and mob him after. Yeah, yeah, I'll talk. Yeah. Yeah. One, one more question. Yeah, so um, I found the the, the chart graph on defense to be quite interesting. How you were, you kind of talked about how it had spikes during certain times, maybe during the World Wars, and um, you know, like the most current uh, data point saw it going up as well. <laughs> um, when for the topic like you know defense, how could you, like, how are you guys, you know, splitting up the you know the parts the party ship parties ship <laughs> on it because. I feel like, in just in terms of, um, you know, parties or political parties, in terms of being a Democrat or being a Republican, but like both of them will be, you know, talking, you know, you know about the event. You know, the I think both parties want to spend more, spend money on it. I think it's just kind of like an overall government thing, you know, throwing money, billions of dollars on. You know yep. what I'm saying? Yeah. So, so let me just say again, kind of what's behind this graph. So, the first step is we have this list of a million and a half phrases that are said in Congress. First step is which of those shall we say are about defense phrases, and we do this using this kind of iterated procedure of finding keywords, searching for them, finding more keywords, searching for them. So at the end of that, what we have is a list of phrases that we're going to say are defense phrases. You know, missile defense, attack Russia, whatever stuff that's about defense. We're then going to take the same model that we have already fit and ask, in a given year. If somebody was going to talk for a minute and they could only talk about defense, how well could I guess their party? And we do that for each year, and, and that's what we plot. So that upward spike means the, the way that these guys are using which phrases Republicans say and which phrases Democrats say are getting more different in those years. Great. So I'll hang around in case people have other questions. Thank you all so much. This was really fun.
thanks, thanks to all of you for coming. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk about this paper. Please feel free to just interrupt me, ask questions as we go along. That's how we tend to do things, and I get nervous if nobody's asking any questions. Um, this is joint work with Jesse Shapiro, who's an economist at Brown, and Matt Taddy, who's a statistician at Microsoft Research and Chicago Booth. Um, and th this paper is part of a broader agenda, I guess, that we have trying to measure and understand political polarization in the US. And the particular thing that we're thinking about in this project is partisan speech and partisan language. Um, so anybody who's been paying attention knows there are people on the right, people on the left in this country talk very differently. This slide is now totally out of date because we've replaced this with 101 new partisan phrases, radical Islamic terrorism, so on and so forth. Um, but you know, over the period of data that we're going to be looking at, which goes back a long way, there are lots of different examples, estate tax and death tax. Uh, you know, Republicans, when they're talking about taxes, like to talk about tax relief because that sounds like relieving some terrible burden from you. Democrats like to talk about tax breaks to describe those same policies because that sounds like somebody's getting out of something that they um, should pay. It was noted after the shooting in Orlando at that nightclub that within a couple of days, at least for us, this may not seem like a methodological challenge to you guys, but we started out basically approaching this using what seemed to us like an obvious statistical methodology, which we then subsequently discovered, as I'll show you, goes way wrong. And so th there's a basic challenge here um, in, in getting good estimates of this change in partisanship over time that account for the fact that the quality of the data is changing, the amount of speech is changing, a lot of other things are changing over time, and we want to try to, try to decompose those. So there, the paper has, in part, a methodological piece. What we're, we're going to show you a couple of measures, um, but the main one that we ultimately focus on is sort of a, a simple choice model using some methods borrowed from machine learning um, and text analysis to try to address that issue. And so we'll look at what is the overall trend, and then we'll try to break that out and decompose what's going on. Um, just, just as background, you know, there is some prior work. There, there's prior work on polarization in Congress. There's prior work on polarization in the public. There's also some prior work on language. Um, the, the takeaway from this literature broadly, and this is part of why this ended up being interesting to us, is it, it mostly has the thrust of the idea we all have that polarization is going way up or that what's happening today is somehow unprecedented is basically a myth. Like, if you look at the data, you don't see that. So, so the literature looking at voters, that's been argued very strongly. Mo Fiorina, who's a political scientist here at Stanford and others have argued basically the idea that the American public is getting more polarized is a myth. The left and right had coalesced into people on the left calling that event a mass shooting, people on the right calling that event a terrorist attack those two things plugging into very different narratives. Um, so we've been interested in, in partisan language for a while. It's clear today, if you look at this, that um, at least a lot of this language does not arise by accident, but that there's a whole sort of industry of focus groups and consultants and people who are trying to think about how to make rhetoric uh, as effective as possible. So these are memos written by Frank Luntz, who's one of the most famous such consultants. Um, these are memos that were distributed to Republican congressional candidates, and they're sort of manuals of how should you talk? What words should you use to talk about taxes? What words should you use to talk about health care? You want to call it Obamacare, a Washington takeover of health care, for example. Um, another example from those memos, this was back in 2006 at the time that George W. Bush was proposing reforming Social Security and there was a big debate about reforming Social Security. Luntz says, when, if you're a Republican talking about that, don't call that privatization of Social Security, which is what basically everybody had called it up until then, because privatization makes people nervous, makes them scared. They think of Russia and Eastern Europe and all kinds of bad things. Instead, say what we're trying to do is personalize Social Security. We want to talk about the personalization of Social Security. 
people like that better in, in his focus groups. Now, that might sound like a good idea. It might sound crazy. Personalization is not a, such an easy word to trip off your tongue. But one of these, basically one of these consultants popularizes using it, and it kind of takes off. But I think there's, there's a bunch of interesting questions, I think, and partly that this research will suggest. I had talked to you, I, th I think, before and uh, was saying to one of your students today, I, something I would love to do is look at, like, with that example of the Orlando nightclub shooting, when things happen and, and these kinds of political framings evolve very quickly in real time, kind of see over that short time span, you know, in the, in the minutes, hours, days after something happens, how long does it take us to figure out, ah, this is the way we should frame it. But that's not going to be this, this paper. This paper is going to ask what, in a sense, is a very simple question, and one, to be honest, we sort of thought of as like, okay, well, we'll do this to start, you know, in the first month and then move on to all the other questions, and that one question ended up being, I won't tell you how many years that we've been working on this. Um, we just want to know, is this a new phenomenon? So to what extent is the partisan division in language that we see today something which has always been true? Is it something which uh, has, it, it might be true in the past just using different words? Is it something that's evolved over time? Maybe it was high in the past, then low, then high? Um, or is it some kind of genuinely new innovation? Um, and so what we're going to do is, we have, we have the f complete text of the US congressional record going back to 1873, based on OCR text. So that's like a verbatim transcript of everything that was said in Congress over that period. You know, each of those years is like a few thousand pages, like bound volumes in the library. Um, and so we're going to try to measure trends in partisanship over that period. There is, um, what is clear if you look at the data is that people in Congress follow this advice. So if you look at the 2005 Congress, Republicans say personal account 184 times and private account only five times. Democrats wildly reversed the other way. I'm not sure quite what happened to the five Republicans who screwed up and said private account, but pretty much everybody is getting the memo and, and following along. And what's also true from, we know this from our past work, from other people's work, is this kind of partisan language doesn't just stay in Congress. It's not some idiosyncratic thing that's restricted to debate in Congress, but it filters out through the media and into the way we all talk about politics. So just as an example, these are headlines from the Washington Post and the Washington Times, center left, way on the right, newspapers respectively. A given event, the Washington Post is using private accounts, the Washington Times is using personal accounts. Michael. Maybe you're getting, we even know that in DC? No. We don't know what, what I, that sort of diffusion is. Yeah, so I think um, there's like a separate really interesting set of questions that we're not going to tackle here that people have, other people have thought about some, but I think there's a lot more work to do understanding how do these things um, get born, diffuse. Um, we, we know for, for many of the individual cases, so like death tax, for example, which is quite a famous example of this as a, as a thing to call the tax that you pay on your estate after you die. Uh, you know, that word, if you trace it back, actually goes way back. So people are using that phrase going all the way back, like in the 19th century, but very rarely. And then there's a specific moment where 